Good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Corinna. I'm uh, a longtime music critic and these days also presenter of events. Um, and it is such a pleasure to have you here to join in this conversation with Teddy Abrams, who is one of the most dynamic conductors in America these days, um, as well as being a composer and a performer. Um, and we thought that you know we would take this opportunity to sort of talk about the craft and the art of conducting, but also the role of classical music and the orchestra in society today, which as music director of the Louisville Orchestra in Kentucky, you are definitely also shaping and redefining. Um, and we will definitely leave some room for questions at the end. Um, and I just thought I would sort of acknowledge, you know, we're also speaking on Friday, so if any of you would like to come to both. We will try and structure it a little differently so that we wait the, um, the question of sort of the craft of the conductor and the social aspect a little differently today and on Friday. So, so please do come back if you can. Um, but it's such a pleasure having a chance to talk to you. You know, usually conductors have a way of turning their backs on us, you know, when we experience you. It's very strange. <laughs> so it's, it's really, really nice to see to you face to face. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, it truly is one of the strangest things to do, actually, if you, if you think about it. Like, I know we just accept that there's a such thing as a conductor and there are orchestras and there's somebody stands there and waves their arms around. But if you actually tried to explain that to, like, an, you know, an alien invasion and said, this is one of the things that people do, and they go to watch this person, like, you actually pay money to not see them. <laughs> and then they, they wave their arms in front of highly capable musicians who spend their entire lives training to do this thing that most of the time doesn't even require this. It would be a strange thing to, to explain, I think. But here we are. But this is what we're going to try and do. You're going to explain so. yourself yes. today. Yes. And yes. <laughs> yes. So um, I just, I, was, I wanted to know if, if we could just get to know you just as, as a musical and, and even as a listener first before we talk about anything else. And um, I was just curious whether you could share any, what was your very earliest musical memory if you have one. It, it was really just playing the piano in our house that my mom wanted to play. Uh, they, they'd purchased this upright piano. Uh, she had hoped that at some point she'd take piano lessons, but never did. And I would go to the piano as a, as a three-year-old and just constantly play it. And my parents thought, maybe we should just get him lessons. And, and I, I did take lessons. I was more interested in kind of improvising my own stuff. I was not a diligent piano student. Uh, and I don't think that I was you know, thinking about a career in music at age four or five or anything like that. There are some people that that's what, that's what they start doing, that they're already on that path. But I did have that moment when I was, uh, I must have been seven years old. I was in second grade in Oakland, California. And the elementary school said, we're going to start a new uh, elementary school band program. We've never done this before, so you're going to be the first class that gets to be an elementary school band. So they brought another elementary school band to show us what a band was. And as second graders, we were mesmerized. We were absolutely mesmerized. I, I can still remember that concert uh, that these other elementary school kids played for us. It was unbelievable. I think that some kids sang, I believe I can fly, which now, you know, that's out. So, um, but anyway, uh, we all signed up. We immediately signed up to play uh, in the band. They like the entire class of third graders. Uh, and I'll never forget. I want to play saxophone. We went to the, the the instrument store to go pick up a saxophone, and they said, "Nope, your fingers are too small. You're going to play something else. What do you want? Flute, clarinet?" And I said, "Okay, clarinet sounds reasonable." And this is the weird thing about this: that with piano, again, I was fine. I, I would do the exercises and studies I was supposed to do. The clarinet, I picked up, started playing, and by the end of the week, I had gone through the whole band book. And I don't know why. It's just a, a, a strange, probably physical phenomenon, and I loved it. I absolutely loved playing the clarinet. I would go and just practice for several hours a day, even then. Like, nobody was telling me that that was what I needed to do. And that's, that's when my love of music really began. I just loved playing the clarinet. I wanted to do it all the time. And uh, that led to, to where I am right now. And, and what was the sort of music that you experienced as a listener during those early years? Was there music in the home? Was there a spiritual dimension to your childhood that included music in any way? Not 
really. We didn't listen to a lot of music. We don't have any, you know, uh, heartwarming, uh, you know, kind of picturesque stories of us all gathering around the, <laughs> the, the gramophone. I wish, I wish we did, but um, it, 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 no, there really wasn't. It's, it's interesting. It was uh, by my family, you know, they're a very, uh, you know, in, in intelligent, cultured family, but music was not really a priority. We didn't go to the orchestra. We didn't uh, sit around discussing, uh, you know, the split of, of uh, you know, Robert Schumann from uh, Richard Wagner. That wasn't something, if we talked about <laughs> Wagner, it was, you know, something related to our Jewish ancestry. It was in that context. Um, but uh, what was interesting is that I think my parents understood that if if you're serious about this, you have to be exposed to the best. And they took me when I was nine years old to go see a San Francisco Symphony concert because I thought, okay, he's really serious about the clarinet. Let's go to a free outdoor concert. That's a good place to start. It was Michael Tolson Thomas conducting all Gershwin. And I'd never seen a professional orchestra before. I'd never seen it. So I'd been playing the clarinet two hours a day as a, as a kid, you know, making squawking noises in, in band and stuff like that. That's what I'd experienced. And then I go to see this all Gershwin concert. And I'll never forget, about five seconds into this, as, as Tolson Thomas was conducting, um, I said, that's what I want to do with my life. And we were way far away because my mom probably thought, ah, he's going to want to go, you know, like, how, how long can we make it through this concert? I, I was enthralled. And I said, I want to be a conductor. And that's, that's, that's what started everything. I, I wrote him a letter. Um, I've, you know, I've told the story a lot, but I wrote him a letter and said, I want to be a conductor. It was a very long, and if I hadn't been nine, it would have been a creepy letter, but uh, <laughs> it was like 10 pages, and I asked for conducting lessons. I really, I just, I was like, I wrote two celebrity letters in my life. I won't tell you who the other one was. It's very embarrassing, but the, I, the, this one I'm proud of, and he wrote me back, and the, that's the thing. He wrote me back, and he said, it's amazing that, that you're, you're so excited about music. I have the letter hanging up in my bedroom because I, I think about it every day. Like, like he took the time yeah. to write me. He didn't have to do that. He could have been one of many, or could, just could have written a thank you and glad you enjoyed the concert, but he took the time to write a long letter that said, you can do this, actually. Here are the things that you should do if you want to be a conductor. Here's what you should do in youth orchestra. Here's how you should listen to music. And here are a few composers I loved when I was your age. You might want to give them a try. And you know that, that little dial that you can flip for, for a kid is, is I mean, it really is life-changing, as cliche and corny as that sounds. I absolutely chalk it up to that single moment. That was a decision that was made by him that led to a life change for me. That's so extraordinary. Um, if, do you remember what you thought conducting was at that time? I mean, it sounds like you responded to the tactile pleasure of playing the clarinet, and you, had, you were producing sounds, but, but here is this, this role in music that doesn't produce any sound and yet is somehow central? This is such a good question because it was, it was a very pure love for whatever was happening on that, that podium. But if this is something you want to do with your life, you have to then ask some really serious questions about why you want to do that. Because the negative motivations for wanting to stand on a podium and wave your arms around and, and like think that, oh, my, all the puppets will do what I, what I want. <laughs> I'm controlling this music. That is a dark path. That is the, that's the dark side. And it's very easy to go there. I, I really feel like with many other related positions of power in society, a, a, a healthy daily questioning of why am I doing this? Why is this something that, that I feel so strongly about? What does this feed in me and what am I bringing then to others through this art form or through this role that I want to have? Whether it's you know CEO, president, general, of, of whatever. If you're in that kind of authority position, I think being able to answer why are you doing this? What are your real motivations here is important. Uh, but I can tell you as a kid, I was so obsessed with the feeling, the raw feeling, which maybe maybe is something like if you were, uh, you know, piloting a 747 for the first time, and like the feeling of actually watching this thing launch off the ground. That must be something extraordinary. I can only guess. That's what it was for me. Uh, I actually found opportunities to conduct when I was just. Um, around nine and ten years old. I would go to uh, any community orchestra and go talk to the conductor and say, will you let me conduct something on your program? And, and several of them did. And I would do you know, a movement of a Beethoven symphony as a ten-year-old. And, and even though I wasn't asking the deep philosophical questions, the raw feeling 
um, there was a, there's a daredevil element to it that probably was very mm -hmm. intriguing. And I'm not adventurous like that in any other way. I don't jump out of you know planes or or mm -hmm. cliff dive or anything like that or drive quickly. Like I, but I loved it. It's the it's the. I wish you could all experience what it's like um, because it is amazing when you breathe and lift your arms up and 80 people uh, produce sound. It's, it's one of the greatest, it's actually, you know, not to j jump around and skip too much, but I, I do think it's not an overstatement. Say the, the way we've been able to configure that as human beings is one of the great uh, concepts put into to action by the species to, to be able to coordinate something that, that there's no uh, verbal communication. It's purely just based on elusive hand gestures and the most extraordinary unified sound comes out of all these people playing different instruments, different lines. I mean, that, that is something that, that represents the best of what human beings can do when they think about cooperation and sharing values. It really, it really is. So maybe, maybe as a kid I was like getting a little bit of that philosophical you know, glint. But so if you can take it apart a little bit for us, I mean, the, the waving of the arms, <laughs> it's oh, yeah. sort of at, almost at the end of the process, right? Because the work of the conductor begins yeah. long before you even get into the rehearsal room with yes. the musicians. Like, talk a little bit about the preparation of a score and maybe also just talk us through the difference between working on a piece that's well-known and well-loved, like a Beethoven symphony, as opposed to something that's just been written with the ink is still wet on the page and you have to yeah. sort of decipher the intentions of the composer really for the first time. That, that's right, yes. And, and the actual act of conducting is separate from the role of being a music director. You know, being in charge of the orchestra from a, a directorial or, or administrative perspective um, is very separate from the, the, the podium time when you're up there waving your arms. Now, Conducting is so fascinating because there, there's kind of like a triangulation of things. I mean, on the one hand, I could teach you all to do it now. I, we, in, in about 10 minutes, I could give you the skills necessary to start a, a pretty broad range of repertoire. I'm not kidding. Like, it, it, I'm, not, I'm not saying this as a joke. Like, I'm, I'm serious. I have a program in Louisville where I teach fourth and fifth graders to conduct. It's, it's really a confidence building program, but they get to conduct the orchestra and they can do it. The physical act of simply starting the music with a decent orchestra is not that challenging, really. It's not that hard. Um, but You mean Kate Blanchett doesn't deserve the Oscar? <laughs> I haven't, I haven't been able to bring myself to see it, I have to say. Oh. I, I, I will, I will at some point after the, after the, the you know, all the excitement dies down. But, but it's true, like, I mean, and also Bradley Cooper's screen tests for um, his Bernstein movie, like, they're amazing, but you could do that. That's not complicated. But conducting is not about whether you can start and stop the orchestra. The, the, I always tell people, think of the definition of conductor, you know, most people veer towards one of two things. One is like a train conductor, you know, who says that time to get off, the station's coming, time to get on. That's one definition. But the one that's much more relevant and meaningful for, for me is the electrical conductor. That what you're trying to do is be a conduit to the artistry and, and the musicality and the capabilities of the musicians you're working with. When you're talking about conducting on a high level, you're talking about something very, very different than simply starting and stopping things. When you're dealing with high school bands, you're starting and stopping things. If they get better, then you can bring some expression into it, but you're mostly just organizing. You're, you're essentially providing a visual code for the beat structure of the music. But, and this, this gets into so many things, I don't know how, how much you think about this, but, but um, almost every kind of music that's been developed around the world follows a pretty strict metrical system. It aligns on a rhythmic grid. Almost every music that human beings have come up with uh, aligns rhythmically at, at, a, at a strict tempo. And usually somebody is keeping that tempo. Uh, that can range from, of course, you know, basic drumming of, of any kind to even just the, 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 the tempo that's kept by, say, a fiddler in, in like an Irish fiddle group or something like that, or a bluegrass group, by doing chops. There's a percussive element that keeps time. Uh, the the so-called classical music world, I use that word very lightly because it's a very dangerous charged word and it doesn't really mean anything, but the, the world of people writing for music uh, for stages uh, that look like Disney Hall, say, 
has created a, a, the opportunity for music to no longer follow the strict metrical protocols of, of almost every form of music around the world. So while there is still a beat, like if you were to listen to a Brahms symphony and try and like, you know, clap along, you could do that, but that would not be the point. That music has um, it kind of disengaged from its vertical, metrical alignment and said, we're more interested in the horizontal contrapuntal system. So what I mean by that is that the way different lines of music relate to each other has a form of rhythm. It's just not rhythm like one, two, three, four, one, two. That form of rhythm takes place on the horizontal. And it means that the beat of so much of the music that we play is not actually steady. Try and, like, listen to a Leonard Bernstein version of a Mahler symphony and try and actually clap along. There's, no, there's nothing to clap to. There is a beat there, but it's constantly changing. It's being expanded and contorted, uh, and, and it's, it's being manipulated to create the, the storytelling narrative of this music, which is launched by the counterpoint. The counterpoint as in the different lines of music that intersect with each other. That's horizontal. This is where conducting gets interesting. Because again, if you're talking about doing a Sousa march, and the drum is going then all you're doing is just confirming the time. You're just saying, everybody, all right, you can all hear the drums, but one, two, one, two. That's, that's not exciting uh, from, a, from a, a, like a creative conducting standpoint. Where conducting gets interesting is when you say, this horizontal nature of the music and the way that you're going to spin that is very much like how I'm, I'm speaking, where I'm emphasizing things. I'm not speaking in a strict tempo, but I am speaking somewhat metrically. I'm emphasizing things. I'm, I'm you know, contracting and expanding parts of the sentence to create the meaning that I want you to, to feel beyond just the words themselves. Like my pattern of speech is very much connected to the content. That's what this music is. I hope I'm not, is this too confusing or weird? Okay, good, but, but, but that's where conducting becomes very much not about keeping time, but, a, but about being a conduit for energy between the musicians so that they are feeling the way the music progresses in a unified manner. Because you're trying to get, you know, you think about like, like you know, Shakespeare, right? Everybody has their own line. They can, they can, you know, ideally perform their lines in a way that makes sense with who spoke before them and who speaks after. Imagine if they're all trying to say the, the same lines the entire time. You just have like 80 people reciting all of, of, of Hamlet at the same time. And you want them all to more or less get the same emphasis and the same contour and the same deeper subtextual meaning. That's where a conductor actually starts to really matter, as opposed to, to being the, you know, um, the, the, either the caricature of like a Mickey Mouse conductor or the mascot. I often joke that <laughs> I could be just the mascot if, without that. But so in, in, in the process of, of shaping that horizontal flow um, that is still somehow connected to the vertical structure, whether it's visible or not, um, there, there are obviously decisions to be made, and, and part of the art is that even in, in a piece as often played as, let's say, Beethoven's Fifth or a Mahler symphony where a lot of it is written out, there is a lot of freedom, right, of interpretation. There are, there are moments where you might shape things, slow things down, emphasize certain things. But where, sort of talk a little bit about who has the power at what point. Like, is it all in the conductor or is it shared with soloists within the orchestra? What happens when you have a concerto with a soloist? Do you defer to their choice of tempo? Like yeah. talk us a little bit for like different <laughs> versions of that. It's, it's such a good question because despite maybe the orchestra sometimes feeling like we're at the peripheral side of culture, if you want to study power dynamics and tacit power and, and you know who controls whom, it's so fascinating because okay you get a composer who could be dead, often as dead if you look at programming by most orchestras. Um, even if they're alive, there's nothing they can do. They can't intervene. They can offer commentary uh, during the rehearsal process, but, but they actually can't stop anything from happening once you go to perform. <laughs> and I know as a composer, when I'm even playing my own music, I feel this disconnect from my composer mind, from that moment when you're trying to you know, in interpret or express some kind of inspiration. That goes away, and then you're just left with whatever you put down on the paper, which, remember, is just a, um, it's a rough guide to the inspiration. Like, if you actually get 
a, a, like a, a lightning bolt of inspiration and you, you, you hear this incredible sound truly in your head, like the most amazing thing and you want everybody to experience that, you want to share it because that's what being a composer is. Like you want people to hear the thing that you heard inside your head. You're not throwing notes up on, on a computer screen, which a lot of people do that. But um, if, if that's, that's what you want, all the tools that we have to, to represent that sound are based on five lines and a bunch of dots and a couple of Italian words. That's all we have. That's the best thing that we've come up with that's still learnable enough. So you've got to use that to essentially represent as well as you can the inspiration. But the inspiration itself, the thing that really made Beethoven want to write the Fifth Symphony is far greater, is far more glorious and amazing and inspiring than anything that he actually wrote. The notes that you actually get on that paper are just a guideline. They are, they are pale in comparison to the thing that he must have experienced when he felt like this is what I needed to tell the world. So you have the, already the composer somewhat separated from the pure musical expression, whatever the perfect, like pl the platonic ideal. Then you have the conductor, who, in, if, you, if you're dealing with an orchestra, is charged with do two things, trying to find a way to translate the actual notes that, that you're left with, which is a code. You know, it's like, it's like a um, you know, um, Sumerian code. We're trying to figure out what do these people really think based on these scribbles and dashes and dots, right? And my job is to do that and also help facilitate the players who ultimately are the only ones that produce any sound. So of the people that make the sound that you hear, one can't do anything at all, and the other one just can only move, can't speak, and can't actually produce tone. This is a very strange dynamic. So everything that actually gets executed is ultimately decided by the instincts uh, and the intellect of the musicians themselves, the actual people producing the sound. Uh, and that is where the, the challenges of conducting come into place. Uh, because not only do all of those musicians have a relationship to each other, if they're a good orchestra that plays all the time, but they already have a relationship to the music that they're playing. Mm -hmm. Every musician in the LA Phil, or the New York Philharmonic, the Berlin Philharmonic, the Louisville Orchestra, they even if it's a piece that's not very familiar, they have a relationship to how to play that music. They know the styles. In some cases, they've played the same piece 50 times in their lives with some of the greatest conductors of all time, or maybe some of the worst conductors too. They've, they have a whole lifetime of experience. Even a, a, a 30 something year old player in one of these orchestras has already played through all the Beethoven, all the Mahler, all the Brahms symphonies. They're coming at this with such a wealth of experience. And then here's what happens. The schedule for every orchestra is basically the same. We always prepare our programs in a single week. We get there flying on a Monday, start rehearsing on a Tuesday. Wednesday, usually two rehearsals, and they're short, by the way. Two and a half hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon. Then one more rehearsal on Thursday. You might play a Thursday, Friday, Saturday show. Maybe you ship the whole thing over, over and do like a Friday, Saturday show. New program the next week. Can you imagine trying to pull off a, a play on that schedule, I'll say, all right, look, we've got Ian McKellen, we've got, we've got all, you know, all the greats, they, they've all done Hamlet a million times, we're gonna put it together three days. You all know your lines, right? Let's just do it. You'll wear this, you wear that, we'll be fine. It would be bizarre, It'd be utterly bizarre, yet we take on Mahler, symphony number five. We say, Tuesday, we start, rehearse once, two times on Wednesday, Thursday morning, and we're good to go. Took Mahler, you know, a year of his life to conceive this thing, and we do it in three days, digest the emotional content of this. A great conductor can accelerate the process of caring about that music. Mm -hmm. Because it's so easy when you're in one of these orchestras and you play 30-something weeks of programs like that, one after another. Look at these schedules. How do you feel emotionally available for that music? That is where a conductor can help. And, and Tilson Thomas told me when I first started conducting professional orchestras, because I'm not telling tales out of school. When, when you go to conduct a professional orchestra as a kid, um, you, you, you see things that, you know, because you're very excited, you're like, this is amazing, I'm, I'm getting to do this, they're, they're, they've hired me to do this thing. And you get there, and it's probably gonna be like a kid's concert or a pop's concert or something like that. And you see 80 tired, um, nonplussed is the perfect word, faces staring up at you like, 
okay, and we're going to be doing the William Tell Overture for this kid's concert, and you think, I'm going to make this the greatest William Tell Overture. <laughs> like, we're going we're gonna to play this like we've never played it before. And you see people, it's like, it's 10 a.m., we have one rehearsal to do this thing, and, and no, no. <laughs> and I, I was... You know, I was confused at first. I thought, well, 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 I thought this was what everybody wanted to do with their lives. You know, I'm, I'm 20 years old, and, and I'm thinking, I thought this is why we all signed up for this. And Tilson Thomas said, look, everybody comes at this with, with their initial love for the music, right? This deep love. Um, and there is that living in every single, even the most hardened, the most curmudgeonly last chair second violinist has that in them. And he says, if you do it right, this huge, giant, ever-expanding cement wall that's been kind of put between them and the music can be shattered instantly. If you, if you do it right, you could get that person. It reminds me a little of like that scene in Ratatouille when, when the, the mean old cr critic... Sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> I but was like, wondering. Yeah, mm. But, but like when he goes to his childhood memory... Mm -hmm. Of the, of the dish, you can do that with, with the musician if the conductor somehow unlocks that. And, and even a player who is, who is a little bit hardened to whatever the experience might be, and, and it's understandable why, can feel like, oh my God, the, the, the Beethoven Seventh Symphony, or this you know, John Adams chairman dances, whatever that piece is, like this is the greatest thing in the world to get to do it. And, and that's where I realized, okay, this is the part of conducting that's really hard, that's really challenging, and nobody really teaches you. Well, and, and surely different com conductors have different ways of, of breaking down that wall, and, and there are plenty of stories and examples of people who do it in, in a pretty forceful way and, and in a sort of tyrannical way. And it sounds like you're sort of advocating for a way to connect to the innate love and enthusiasm that's in people. and so. So, I mean, is it, is it about finding language? Is it about finding metaphors? I mean, I'm thinking also as, as a critic who sort of tries to put the experience into words afterwards, like how much do words matter in rehearsal when you try and get people to feel what you want them to feel? Yes, and that's where the, the, the actual relational stuff happens. It's in the rehearsal process. If you want to see what conducting really is about, you should go watch the rehearsals because if, by the time they get to the concert, they can't do it, <laughs> then that's a problem. The rehearsals are where the, the, the relationship develops, and you find a way of trying to relate to these musicians. I, I will just you know, put out there as an aside that the process of trying to do all this as a guest conductor in a single week is absurd. You, it can be done, but trying to forge a relationship with 80, 90 musicians from Tuesday to Thursday and you have four quick rehearsals when you're also under immense pressure to just get the thing to sound good is really, really difficult. I, I find that the process of, of working with my home orchestra in, in Louisville, you know, a, a very different thing because you're, when you're rehearsing, you're not just rehearsing to play one good concert and then leave. You're rehearsing to think about the development of the whole institution, about relationships with people I'll see week after week, their, their family to me. Uh, and, and yes, you're right that the conductors today emerged from a long, I, I don't know if it's an evolutionary history, but it's, but it's definitely a, like an Old Testament history. They were, they were mean, difficult people generally in, in the past. The, these rules about how uh, uh, orchestras comport themselves and how schedules are, are presented um, are very much a product of, of many of the, the abuses of conductors in the past. And, and I'm not talking about like, you know, our sensitivity today. I'm talking about Conductors were really terrible. Like they, they could be. There were a few nice ones, but in general, America tried to build a a kind of vibrant European style culture modeled on the great European capitals, mostly a 19th century model. That was America's way of saying, "Look, we we want to be able to compete on an international cultural stage." So to do that, Cleveland needs to have an orchestra that can outplay the Vienna Philharmonic. How are we going to get there? You get an authoritarian, commanding conductor who will will it into being. That was George Sell. You had uh, conductors like that built all the, 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 the great orchestras of the 20th century in America. These egomaniac, um, also incredible musician conductors, but they were so egocentric. Like they, they willed this into being in the most random cities that had no like historical reason to have orchestras playing Beethoven and Brahms. There's no reason that, that like Pittsburgh or Louisville or Houston 
Or San Francisco would have this as like their dominant culture, like trace a line for me and explain why that would be the thing that we all do. It was just because these places said we must have it, we will have it, and they found people that would, would basically strong arm the, the musicians and, and the, the donors and everybody into getting them what they wanted. And they produced some magnificent results, but it came at an emotional cost to the musicians that did, that did many things. One, I mean, it's just obviously a terrible thing to, to, to destroy people. Um, uh, and that, that did happen a lot. There were no rules. You could just fire people at will. Rehearsals could just be extended randomly. And they, it was tyrannical. But the other thing is it, it, it led to this situation where players and orchestras often don't feel empowered to be the artist that they, they once believed themselves to be. And I say this with hesitation because there are many, many incredible members of these orchestras who find a way to express their full artistry. But if the whole point of your life is conform, 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 do what that conductor says or else your, your, you know, your life is, is over. Um, and remember, what else can you do? I mean, some people can reinvent themselves, but you spend eight hours a day practicing for that job and you got it. If, if that's over, it's, it's over. That, that does something to you uh, long term, artistically and, and probably physically too, that I, I want to avoid. Um, and it's really hard because when you're up there on the podium, you get what I call um, podium personality. And sometimes even the nicest people turn into these like monsters. It's like, it's like Dr. Jekyll and, and, and they become the Mr. Hyde's stand as soon as they get on that podium. I don't know why. And I've had to watch that in myself because you do want everything to be amazing and you do want the best out of the music. But you have to remember that these are, these are musicians who, who are artists and they have something to say. And if you, if you knock that out of them and it's all just about execution and, and you know, conforming, you, you might win the battle of a single concert, but you'll, you'll lose the long-term thing which orchestras provide for a society, which is, again, a reflection of some of the best things that people can do. So can you give some examples of how you create more power and freedom for the musicians in your orchestra? Like, is it about redefining the role of the orchestral musicians to expand into education and to have more chamber concerts? Or, or is it more behind the scenes, consulting on, on decisions? It's a, it's a combination of a lot of things. Uh, and no one has done this perfectly. One, it's just really hard to do. Um, and two, there isn't really a model for it. But I think a good example would be this initiative that we've started uh, partnering with the Commonwealth of Kentucky, the, the, the government there, the state legislature. Uh, we're going to be touring all of the Commonwealth, all of Kentucky for the next two years. Uh, and we're talking about doing deep residencies in some of the smallest towns. We pitched this to the, to the legislature, not as an arts program, uh, but as an opportunity to break down the urban-rural divide uh, and to help to do our part with music. Uh, and this is the kind of thing where our musicians themselves are central to this. This cannot be done just by putting on great programs and then moving on. If you're plopping down in Harlan, K Kentucky, if you're plopping down in Pikeville, Kentucky, and you're going to do a deep residency where your musicians are going to fan out and spend the, the mornings and afternoons working with school groups, uh, going to, say, community choir practice and, and collaborating, and then ultimately bringing all these folks that they've met to the concerts to actually work together and put on collaborative shows, that requires individual fortitude and responsibility that's usually not asked of people if the only thing they do is rehearse and perform on a big stage that, that we're used to at performing arts centers. And that's where I think... You, you need the entire ecosystem because all of us love the experience of doing a Mahler symphony where you do need to just say, I, I acquiesce. I, w I will be part of this bigger vision. That is a beautiful thing. But if that's the only thing, mm -hmm. then it, it's, it, it becomes a routine. It lacks its, its specialness. And that's why we want these programs, which do largely center around community engagement. And, and there's been this sad kind of tiering in uh, main, mainstream arts organizations around the country. What we really do is on stage. All this education, community engagement and stuff, it's important. We tell foundations and donors but they don't really usually value it. If you said, are they equal? Are they equal? Do you think that, that, that the Beethoven Seventh Symphony is equal in importance to uh, doing this community program where you're working with uh, you know, a, a local band in, in Western Kentucky? 
okay, I don't know what they'll actually say, but I know what most people will think. And you've got to change that. Those two things are equal because they are equivalent in the end. You don't have a healthy society that cares about Beethoven, Brahms, John Adams, Mahler, any of this stuff, if the people that you're trying to reach have no relationship to it. Otherwise, you're just doing this theoretically in, in, in like a little snow globe. It's, that, that, that's, that's nonsense. If you don't reach the actual people that you are making music for, then it's, it's all, it's just built on nothing. It's a house of cards. Yeah. So hearing you talk, it's so fascinating because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of wondering how much more desirable a job is to be a music director in a smaller town like that where you're the, really the big fish, you're the only fish <laughs> in the state, as opposed to leading one of several orchestras in New York or in London where not only you know, do you have the best musicians because it's the most desirable job, but also your audience is the most knowledgeable and it's like fed by a steady stream of tourists with cultural aspirations. And, and I'm just sort of curious, I mean, hearing you talk, it actually sounds like there is something really exciting about being able to redefine what an orchestra can be and whom it can serve in a place like Louisville. Yes, which by the way, actually resembles more the historical origins of orchestras than the modern, like super polished, we present concerts every single week in repertoire and, and people will come to hear this, this great orchestra's interpretation. Like that would have been very foreign to the, the era of Mozart and, and, and Beethoven and, and even Brahms. Uh, these towns were much smaller in fact, the, the community that, that uh, musicians might have played for could have been just the, the estate uh, of the particular noble that employed them. It might have been a very small audience that was incredibly familiar with every single musician um, under that noble's employ. Mm -hmm. And we have expanded this to, to such a scale that it starts to break down the real meaning of what we're doing. I believe in the functionality of music in, in society. I think there's a deep reason that we have music around, and it's not simply um, to, to say our town has this great orchestra that won a bunch of Grammys. It has a function in maintaining social cohesion, and therefore a responsibility on the part of the people running these institutions to further that mission. And these are not separate from artistic quality. That's the thing that I think a lot of people get hung up on. It's like, well, if you're going to go off and do all these programs, then doesn't that mean that you're going to degrade the quality? Uh, you're, like you're not going to value the highest level of playing when it comes to musical style. I think it's the exact opposite. I think that if, if I know that I'm playing for my community, these are people that value our orchestra. They value the musicians in the orchestra. They know the musicians, which, again, those were the conditions in Haydn's time. There was a very personal, um, intimate relationship between Haydn's symphonies that were presented and the audiences that heard them, which were about 200 people at the, the concerts in London when his most famous symphonies were presented, and just one household at Esterhaza when he was employed there. That's meaningful music making. It starts to look like uh, that music is there for a deeper purpose. Those people gathering, sharing this, are, are communing in a way that no other language reaches. Um, and therefore, that for me is the model for, for what the organizations can do today. Um, it's not going to be the same kind of music or exclusively the same kind of music. It has to change artistically, but it's the same model. Because Louisville is a, is a city, like, like all American cities, that has a lot of challenges. And we can't have delusions of grandeur saying, well, the orchestra is going to solve them. We're not going to solve you know, the, the challenges around policing in Louisville. We're not going to you know, solve the, 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 the perennial budget issues that the, that the metro government has. But we can start to think about ways of making life as, as meaningful and connected as it can possibly be in that community and saying, where are the connections not being made right now? Where are the people not meeting each other? Where are the divides? And how do we use a language that's meant to bridge divides in a way that, that gives it its full value? That is so beautiful that I feel that that may well be where I would end our conversation and maybe leave a little bit of time for questions from, from anyone in the room. Um, yeah, go ahead. So you want to talk a little bit about the situation with the guest conductor. It seems to me, as you describe the person, it's almost impossible to get an evaluation in two ways. Is there homework done by both the guest conductor and the orchestra that sort of says, okay, I know where these people are coming from and therefore I know what to expect when this guest conductor arrives? That is a really good question. Yes, 
So yeah, the, the question is, is there any homework that's done prior to a guest conducting week by both the conductor and the orchestra? You know, how, how do you actually do this meaningfully? I will say, before I go too far down the path of saying it's all totally meaningless, if you, if you have um, a real way of, of, of connecting with the music that you're conducting, like there is certain repertoire that I've done my whole life that I, I feel so strongly about. I've, I've just physically been through the repertoire so much that I think when I do that with an orchestra, I actually can bring something to the table uh, right away that they, hopefully they, they recognize and it feels like, oh wow, something's happening here through just the physical movement. I would prefer a longer period of, of working together and getting to know each other. Uh, I found that the orchestras often don't really know much about the conductors that come. They're seeing a lot of them. They may have just come from a week where they did a Pops concert, three education concerts, um, and one of those live to picture movie things. So they saw three different conductors that week and then they see you the next week. Um, and all they're gonna get is, unless you're super famous, this is what I call like, I call it jokingly the Obama effect because orchestras play better when they're concentrating. And if you just put a famous person, like if, if Obama walked on the podium, the orchestra would sound so good. He wouldn't even have to do anything. <laughs> Everybody would be so just all there. You would not believe like what, what, what that would do. But if you can find a way to, to recreate that same level of concentration, you can get great results. But often they don't know each other. I mean, there are all kinds of jokes about that too. I can, I'll tell you later off the... <laughs> off the <laughs> century music on is unlistenable, I'm paraphrasing, but, uh, uh, and then related in a way, what is the nature, or rather the demographics, meaning age, of your audience, I assume it's high, and how do you get it lower? Oh, those are, <laughs> that's, that, those are huge questions, and they're, and they're really good questions. So, so one question was about programming. Yes, and yes, and, de and demographics. demographics. Yeah. Um, how can I say it succinctly? I think they're actually incredibly connected questions. People, people get most excited about a, a personal relationship to the art that's happening, even if it's a perceived one, even if like it's social media or something creates the effect of having this personal connection, whatever it is, um, that personal connection is extremely valuable. Because we have focused so much on art from a different era and, a, and, and from a different place, and we have said, this is the canon, it's, it's you know, very much a Bloom-style order. We can, we can say Bach and Beethoven are here, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, and then Brahms on the next tier. Like, there's a tier, and it goes all the way down. Because we've done that, we have distanced people so much from the experience of feeling like they have ownership over the stage. When you turn it around and you say, actually, what you're going to see on stage is music that you're connected to. Maybe you know these composers, maybe they're embedded in your community. Just like people got to experience when they were hearing premieres of Schumann or uh, Schubert or Beethoven. Then people who are younger that are part of that experience will want to be there. And that's one of the things we've done in Louisville. We have three full-time composers that we've put into the community. They work full-time for the orchestra. This hasn't happened since like the mid 19th century in, in Europe. They are not one commission composes, there are three full-time composers. The whole idea, it's a study. What if their neighbors, their neighborhood, get to know these people? Every time they have a premiere and they saw them in the coffee shop working or they, they did a little you know, neighborhood event and, and heard the progress of their, their, their pieces that they were composing, you'll want to be there for that. That's really meaningful. Uh, and I think that, that kind of answers both questions. To program in a way uh, that puts the art that's being made now front and center and with the context of great art from the past, is the way that you get a vibrant community of people, old and young, coming to concerts on a regular basis. Is it working? Well, I, I, I would be very, is, our whole industry is so dangerously, perilously fragile. I will knock very hard on this wood, but yeah, it, it, it really was. Um, and then the pandemic happened and now, you know, we, we have to build it back up, but ticket sales and subscription sales, and not even connected to what was on the program. 
were rising really astronomically. People were trusting that the experience would be interesting, even if it wasn't a piece that they were aware of or familiar with. And that is what we wanted. We wanted people coming because they believed in the orchestra, not just to hear Beethoven's Fifth and Ninth Symphonies, the Rhapsody in Blue, Carmina Burana. If that's the only thing people come to hear, game over. You can have one orchestra touring those pieces around the entire United States every year. That would be fine. It would save a lot of money. It would save a lot of money for a lot of people. Uh, and, I, and I don't believe that, though. I believe that having that orchestra putting out vibrant art is essential to a community. Um, and so, yes, uh, I, I'd like to think. But there's still a lot of work. <laughs> I think we'll, we'll all join you in knocking on wood. Yes, and I know. Yeah. And thanking you for just such a fascinating oh, and thank, thank you all for having me. Conversation. Thank you, thank you, Karina, <laughs> for amazing questions and have a great rest of your uh, festival. This is such a cool place. So thank you. It was amazing. <laughs>